Guruji Dakri. Well, I'm really impressed with the turnout. It's, it's uh, quite impressive, and I'm glad to see that there are people here interested in this whole question dealing with Ukrainian archives. I'd like to begin this uh, presentation on a positive note, that although the title of my presentation suggests uh, challenges and prob problems, I can state with some optimism that compared to other Canadian ethnocultural groups, the Ukrainian community in Canada is perhaps amongst the leading organized groups with a well-established academic and archival heritage that dates back to the Second World War and even earlier. Uh, my comments today, uh, well, are based on my own experiences working in the field of uh, Ukrainian-Canadian studies and in particular in contacts with the Ukrainian community archives. And I'm talking about the Ukrainian Labor Temple in Winnipeg, uh, Osaradok in Winnipeg, the Ukrainian-Canadian Research in uh, uh, well, uh, research and Documentation Center in, in Toronto. <laughs> Proof of the uh, contemporary status of Ukrainian archives in Canada is the recent publication under the direction of Professor Irina Matyash, Archivna Ukraina Kav Kanadi Dovidnek, published in Kiev in two, 2010, and it's 881 pages long, so I, I didn't bring it with me. <laughs> we have it, I can bring it. Yeah. <laughs> There have been earlier Dovidniks published by various Ukrainian-Canadian institutions, including some those published by the Large <coughs> and Archives Canada. For example, a guide to... Uh, this is the, uh, uh, the, uh, the one that was published in 1984 at the uh, Library and Archives Canada. And uh, I, it was the first guide published by the Multicultural Archives Program there. And subsequently, there were others published on the Polish, Finnish, Jewish, and uh, German communities. <clears throat> when I worked at the Library and Archives Canada, almost every year I attended the Canadian Association of Slavists conferences. And this is where I met a lot of you there. And I presented the papers on some aspect of East European, and in particular, Ukrainian archives. Some of these issues discussed today were also discussed at these annual meetings. To better understand the contemporary situation among the Ukrainians, Ukrainian archives in Canada, it is important to summarize the main and unique characteristics, themes, issues within the community. Although some of you may disagree with my description, this is based on my own study of the history of the Ukrainian community in Canada. To understand Ukrainian archives, you have to understand Ukrainian-Canadian uh, history. Okay. <clears throat> First part are the waves of immigration. This is sort of core to the understanding of uh, the Ukrainian experience in Canada. Three main waves of immigration prior to World War I, interwar period, after World War II, the DP immigration displaced persons, and post-1980, mostly from Poland, and post-91, mostly from an independent Ukraine. Each wave has its own unique characteristics and made their own contributions to the preservation and development of the Ukrainian Canadian community. Second, <clears throat> the second, the struggle for an independent Ukraine, 1980, 18, 1991. And through all my work in the archives, this is a constant theme, regardless of what organization you look at, women's organizations, uh, uh, youth organizations. This theme is the underlying theme and it comes up. So in each wave of immigration, there were community leaders who campaigned both within and outside the community for an independent Ukraine. Ukrainian nationalists assumed, assumed aspects of a political exile community and this influenced the organization and politics of the community. Third, was the core churches, uh, the Greek Catholic and Greek Orthodox churches from 1918 until recent years. These, these churches have created religious and secular organizations that were in competition. In some cases, this situation has impeded joint political action in connection with the Canadian federal government and larger Canadian society. And here I have examples, for example, of Monsignor Kushnir. Semen Sevchuk, who uh, were one of the founders and headed 
the Ukrainian Canadian uh, Committee Congress in the 1940s until the 1960s. I also have example of Reverend Schluzar from Montreal who founded the Ukrainian Orthodox Church in Montreal and he was involved in a number of secular organizations, for example, Ukrainian War Veterans Association and he was an officer in the Ukrainian Army uh, during the Wars of uh, Liberation and he was involved in various other activities in the uh, community in Montreal and including some business deals. So I acquired his papers for that reason, but not the religious material, but we'll can discuss that later. Fourth is the uh, left-right political division within the uh, community, and I call that the Cold War. <clears throat> this is the main motor that drove the community between the uh, pro-communist and pro-nationalist segments. This rivalry encouraged the publication of newspapers, historical and political literature, and the establishment of political and cultural organizations and institutions. The political division was influenced, has influenced the historiography of the Ukrainian-Canadian community, and to some extent, this has continued until today. <clears throat> Fifth, the establishment of an independent Ukraine, 1991, and the war with Russia. <clears throat> the establishment of independent Ukraine has profoundly changed the relationship between the Ukrainian-Canadian community and Ukraine and also in cha ch changed the internal dynamics within the community. <clears throat> uh, archives and libraries in Ukraine are now potential alternatives for the preservation of archival material. However, the war with Russia has prolonged the uncertainty regarding the Ukrainian government's stability and archival uh, security. <clears throat> uh, sixth, linguistic cultural preservation and assimilation. From the very beginning of Ukrainian immigration to Canada, there were pressures from the host society to integrate and even assimilate. Because experiences in Eastern Europe, uh, before the First World War, after the First World War, with uh, Poland and Soviet Union, there were serious efforts made from within the community to preserve Ukrainian language and culture in Canada. And this was cons uh, because Ukrainian culture in Ukraine was considered to be under threat. <coughs> And I'm mentioning these points because they all affect the situation of Ukrainian archives in Canada. First, what, what is meant by Ukrainian archives in Canada? Uh, the, the, the bigger question is what is meant by archives? So I'll begin a little bit with the basics. The core activities of an archives is to acquire the uh, Core activities of an archive is to acquire, appraise, arrange, describe historical material in various media that is one of a kind. And I think this is a very important point. What can sustain a community <coughs> archives are the archival records themselves and the evidence they contain. Recognition that archives are different from library, museum, art gallery, and other cultural institutions <coughs> and require from the archivist specialist skills and knowledge that are different from volunteers, librarians, and clerical staff. <laughs> Tendency is to give the care of archives to individuals whose expertise lie in other areas. And this is a main theme and in, 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 in a constant theme in my work at the archives over in Ottawa is that I would meet people working in archives <coughs> and they haven't got a clue what archives are all about. Now, also, based on my experiences uh, in Ottawa, the Canadian multiculturalism policy announced in 1971 was not accepted by everyone, including people who worked at the archives, and I'm talking about the main administration at the archives, the people there who were opposed to, multi to the multiculturalism policy. And there were people in the Ukrainian community who were opposed to the multiculturalism policy. <clears throat> the concept of Canada as a country with two official languages but no official culture was a problem. This was especially evident when I dealt with some of the leaders uh, of the Ukrainian community who came to Canada after World War II as part of the displaced uh, persons movement. Uh, and this attitude is reflected today in, in, in some of the politics in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, 
going away from multiculturalism and actually seeing multiculturalism as some kind of a, an obstacle to, to national development. And this deals because of the large influx of immigrants from Africa and, and Asia. <clears throat> now, when I began to work at the uh, archives in Ottawa, the concept total archives was prevalent. This meant that uh, archives were acquired, or the, the goal was to acquire archives by media, and this is sort of a horizontal kind of plane, uh, textual records, photos, sound, film, digital, and also a horizontal from all levels of the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, vertical, all levels of a community, society, association, and organizations. And this meant from national headquarters down to local branches. And the, ob the objective there is to get a slice of Canadian society at that time, and in the Ukrainian archives, a slice of Ukrainian Canadian society, so that we have just you know a, a good idea what went on, uh, because sometimes directives were given at the national headquarters and how were they implemented at the lower levels, or was there a connection between headquarters and the local branches? <coughs> By the early 1980s, archives in Ottawa <coughs> suffered a series of budget cutbacks and there was a growing lack of archival storage space. So the emphasis then became on national significance. Now, the question there is, uh, and this would also include Ukrainian archives in Canada. Well, what's meant by national and what is meant by national significance? This required the introduction of selective criteria according to some standards. And in some cases, uh, donations of archives were uh, refused because the material offered did not meet the selection criteria. And this, I could say, was probably the most difficult part of my job, is to say no. Uh, people would come to Ottawa, they want to donate material, which to them was very important, significant to the community, but because they didn't fall into this criteria of national significance, uh, uh, I had to say no. And it was my fault. But, uh, Myron Momrick said that uh, we cannot accept this material. <laughs> so. Anyways, <clears throat> a few words on... Okay. <clears throat> there was also this idea, again, uh, some of the organizations uh, did follow this total archives concept, and this was also uh, painful, because in some cases, anything Ukrainian was to be saved. To je svjata mova. And people brought books with them from Ukraina. And this material had to be saved. I'll give you a quick anecdote. Uh, uh, there was a, a delegation of, uh, from a Ukrainian women's organization from Toronto that was uh, visiting Ottawa. And they took them to the storage center, which is uh, another building uh, <coughs> in the outskirts of Ottawa, to show them basically how they stored duplicates and books and things like that there. Also, it was a center where they pulped books that were damaged, either through mold, the covers were torn off, pages were missing, and whatever. <clears throat> and just as they were viewing the machinery, they were pulping Taras of Chenko's Kobzar. <laughs> <laughs> so next time I went to Toronto, and I was trying to get these women's organization to donate, it was a national women's organization to donate the records. The question was, Pane Mamrik, Čevi tam pračujete v Otavi, da neščut ukrajinsku kulturu? I said, no. <laughs> I said, that was the national library and I work at the archives. <laughs> it's the rare community archives that has resources to acquire everything Ukrainian. Uh, community archives cannot acquire everything, so it is important to have acquisition strategy. Uh, and this is one suggestion that came out through one of the discussions that we had at the CAS. Should individual Ukrainian archives in Canada specialize? One archives would do literature, another would do history. Uh, some would do Ukrainian pioneer era, uh, labor movement. Um, Second World War, very popular with uh, researchers and with the general public. <coughs> Displaced persons, also very popular. People want to know uh, 
when did their parents, grandparents immigrate to Canada? So you would be surprised <coughs> that sometimes these parents, grandparents do not tell their children what they did during the Second World War, what they did in the displaced persons camps and their immigration to Canada. Now, uh, they also, some of the institutions may also specialize in certain media, photos, oral history, film. Again, this is subject for debate, but I guess in a country like Canada, you can't really do that. Uh, you can't have literary archives in Calgary and uh, historical archives in Toronto dealing, let's say, with the Divisia or something like that. Uh, it, it, the country is just too big. So something has to be done, basically, uh, but there has to be some kind of specialization. As I said uh, earlier, uh, Ukrainian community archives cannot acquire everything. <coughs> the acqu acquisition of digital archives is a serious problem because a lot of the records now, for example, uh, Cook National Headquarters in Ottawa, they do a lot of their business on the internet and whatever, and uh, this has to be preserved. In the good old days, they did letters. That could be preserved. Now it's digital, uh, emails. <laughs> and there's a need for, uh, this is a problem because there's a need for sophisticated equipment to preserve digital archives. And I should mention that uh, in Ottawa, the uh, uh, National Ar Archives has spent tons of money trying to come up with a permanent solution to preserve uh, uh, digital records and it has been unsuccessful. They have flown people from Australia, from South Africa, whatever, and uh, nothing happened. The, the, the technical machinery is not there. So uh, this is something that has to be taken into consideration. Uh, the archives has stopped microfilming, and they've started digitizing. But again, how long will this digitizing material uh, uh, will be preserved? We don't know. Our, uh, microfilm, uh, it's some, according to some people, it's up to four or 500 years if they're preserved under the right conditions. Also, archives, <coughs> community archives, should also specify what category of archival material they do not wish to acquire. For example, any material that originates from the Ukrainian churches should be directed to the archives of these churches. Of course, there are some exceptions, and I, I mentioned them earlier, about uh, Reverend Kushnir and, uh, <coughs> and uh, Semen, uh, Reverend Semen Soucher. Also, <coughs> for example, we have the papers of uh, Reverend uh, Michael Horoshko, who was a chaplain in the Canadian Army during the Second World War. So he's a chaplain, clergyman, but we did acquire his papers because he was involved in Europe, in England, with the Ukrainian Canadian Servicemen's uh, Club there, and also with uh, <coughs> refugees uh, and displaced persons in Europe, and of course with the Ukrainian Canadian soldiers. Also in the Ukrainian community, <clears throat> some leaders drew a sharp distinction between the community and the federal government. They saw themselves as political exiles, and donating records to Ottawa was, was seen as some form of capitulation. Some cited the, uh, some causes for alienation from the federal government. Uh, some cited internment operations during the First World War, internment during the Second World War. Others mentioned the presence of the Soviet embassy in Ottawa as reasons why not to donate their archival material to Ottawa. Now, with the independence of Ukraine, archival material originating in Europe may be donated to archival institutions in Ukraine. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. However, this is uh, still a problem because of lack of finances and resources in Ukraine. In some commun ethnocultural communities, th this is an ongoing debate whether archival material should be preserved in Canada or sent to the country of origin. And I would mention the Latvian community in Canada, which is a small community. And they have an archives in Toronto. And they have some archives in, um, in Ottawa, but mostly in Toronto. And the debate there is, should they send their archives to Latvia or should they keep it in Canada? Now, the older generation, people who came as displaced persons and their first generation, <coughs> want to send it to Latvia. Second, third generation want to keep it here because it's part of their Canadian experience. But it's a small community and there's danger of, uh, of language loss, assimilation, and then what do you do? Who's going to look at this material? Are people going to come from Latvia to, to look at these records? Uh, this is something that's also 
this is an important question also for, for Ukrainian Canadians, but we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit later. Uh, my co uh, my uh, answer to some of these problems is that, for example, uh, Ukrainian American material that's found in Canada should go to Ukrainian institutions in the United States. Harvard Ukrainian Institute, and uh, I understand there's a Ukrainian archives opened a few years ago in Detroit. And uh, when the Sheptitsky Institute moved from, uh, from Ottawa to Toronto, they had a large collection of newspapers, including uh, Ukrainian-American newspapers from places like Philadelphia, whatever, World War I, World War II, very rich resource. Uh, again, we had to find a place for it, and some of it was sent to Harvard, and some of it was uh, sent to Toronto. Also, Library and Archives Canada has a number of collections from Western Europe which are called Cold War Fonds, uh, Cold War collections. Uh, Kubiovic uh, collection is one, Andrei Zhuk, and they were sent to Canada for preservation purposes. Uh, so eventually, uh, they are stored here, uh, thanks to the Library and Archives Canada, and they're stored here, and the understanding is that they will be sent to Ukraine once the situation in Ukraine is stabilized and clarified. Uh, there's hardly any uh, Canadian content. There is some in the Kubiovich collection dealing with the creation of Kios and the Ukrainian encyclopedia that was published in, uh, in Toronto. Uh, regarding acquisitions, <coughs> a great aid to acquisitions is obtaining a charitable status by community archives where archives can issue a tax receipt for donations of archival material. Although this is certainly of benefit to the archives, it also can cause some problems with donors who have an unreal, unrealistic opinion of the value of their donations. And I can tell you part of my job at the archives in Ottawa was dealing with these people. <coughs> and uh, they would also, do, you know, uh, income tax, a receipt was issued for material was, that was donated during a calendar year, which is, you know, uh, 31st of December, the end of the uh, calendar year. <coughs> so between Christmas and New Year's, I would get donations <laughs> in Ottawa. People would drive up, and uh, they, sometimes I'd be, on, I'd be on holidays, and they would leave these boxes on my chair or on my desk, and they expect this material to be processed and they would get an income tax receipt, hopefully, <laughs> for that year. And, uh, and again, uh, you know, you try to deal with these people and uh, it's a problem. And some of these were very important uh, community leaders. <clears throat> now, uh, individuals and organizations who, that donate material should also be encouraged to make a financial donation along with the archival material. This will assist with the transportation, storage, organization, and evaluation of archival material. If donors wish to donate after their death, they should include a monetary donation in their will along with the material they wish to donate. Now, this is not only for archival material, because again, people have, you know, Vishevanya, they have uh, all kinds of artwork, they have uh, uh, Ukrainian uh, embroidered shirts, etc., etc., that they want to donate, and uh, <clears throat> it's not—it's—it's it's more than just donating. You have to I include some kind of financial incentive, and as I said, it's the same with archives. If you, if if there's a monetary, because you have to hire people to even transport the material, and you know, transporting material in 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 Canada is a problem. Long distances. <clears throat> now. For a community archives to be sustainable, there must be sound. Let me just okay. For a community archives to be sustainable, there must be sound archival practices, depending on the availability of skilled staff within a custodial structure. This means employing a professionally trained archivist or having access to an archivist. What is required among professionally trained archivists is personal commitment and inspired work. The archivist should take the lead and supervise or direct services such as acquisition, appraisal, arrangement, and description. The archivist can also perform a facilitative or advisory role and encourage collaboration and planning. Some co community archives continue to exist only because of the passionate commitment of one or two individuals. And this is fairly common in the Ukrainian community. And once something happens to that individual, then you have a real serious problem. 
However, it's not, this is not sufficient to sustain an archives in the long term. The archivist must have access to training courses, professional development, membership in professional archival uh, organizations. <coughs> community connection. For a community archives to be sustainable, there is a need for a community connection and the preservation of good community support. One organizational factor to ensure sustainability through communi uh, community connection is volunteers preferably with some knowledge and experience with archives. Also, volunteers should work under the guidance of a trained archivist, or at least have access to an archivist. As with archivists, volunteers must have access to training courses, professional development, and if possible, membership in archival associations. Workshops open to the public can be arranged with experts and professionals in various fields, for example, photo preservation, document analysis, uh, official documents in Ukrainian or other languages, Ex exhibit preparation, uh, introduction to his history issues. You cannot really get involved in archival work in the Ukrainian community if, if you don't know the history. You have to know the history. Some methods of rewarding volunteers should be considered. For example, uh, public recognition and awards. I volunteer at the Canadian Museum of History and uh, every three or five years I get a pin <laughs> with a number on it three or five or eight, and also I get free parking. <laughs> <laughs> Arrangements can be made with local universities, community colleges that teach archival science. Students may be invited to work on short-term projects and assist with uh, in other areas of the archives. <clears throat> Partnerships can be formed with archival institutions with a legislative mandate that includes a reference to diversity and multicultural. And this is very important because if they have a legislative mandate, then they have to, by law, acquire and maintain an archives. And in their mandate, they, they say that, oh, we promote diversity in Canada and all this multiculturalism, then all the more reason to approach these institutions and to work out some kind of a partnership with them. And, uh, <coughs> and this, uh, by, by these institutions, I mean Library and Archives Canada, provincial archives, local government, uh, city archives, and university archives. Uh, uni university of Alberta here, uh, the Folklore Center has an archives. The university of Toronto has an archives that holds a number of uh, Ukrainian folk. To use another example, the University of Ottawa, uh, there's a chair of Slovak studies. So the uh, professor there has started uh, or initiated and maintained a Slovak community archives. There are also Slovak material uh, at, the, um, at the Library and Archives Canada. And this is something that community archives will have to face sooner or later. What do you do with long-term preservation? And long-term, I mean like 30, 40, 50 years down the road. And this is the, these are the institutions you have to approach. Institutions that have a legislative mandate. Also, when it comes to community organizations, they should be encouraged to have something in their constitution, in their regulations, about preserving archives. Because you have people who are elected to executive positions with these organizations, and archives is not on the radar screen at all. Okay? If it's on the radar, if it's in their constitution, they have to mind, take care of their archives, and they have to set money aside, budget aside, to take care of archives, and for long-term planning. And uh, it's one thing to... Uh, uh, have an organization, even a national organization, but if there's no planning for archives, then it's a problem. And also, uh, I should mention that in some Ukrainian national organizations, this is deliberate. They don't. I, I approached one organization in Toronto several years, many years ago, and they said, "We are interested in today and tomorrow. We're not interested in museums or archives or whatever." You know, so fine. Uh, I asked them to show us their archives, and he took me to the janitor's room mops and pails and says, oh, this is it. Now, uh, in many cases, these organizations, especially the national, at the national level, maintain their own archives. However, many smaller and local organizations do not have a central location to preserve their material. Uh, a community archives can actually approach these organizations who don't have these kind of facilities, and an offer to preserve their records in a community, as a community service, and also request 
an annual donation or volunteer labor for this purpose. And I have in my home in Ottawa a number of boxes from strictly Ukrainian community organizations in Ottawa that are not, don't have any national affiliations. And people didn't know what to do with them. And usually I would get them after somebody died. And they would say, oh, upon, and they would catch me on the, on the doorsteps of the church on Sunday morning. <laughs> oh, Mr. Mamrik, I got some stuff here for you. you know, So-and-so passed away. And sometimes it's interesting material. Sometimes it's, it's nothing very special. It's uh, usually from people uh, who went through the whole DP experience, accumulated photographs, documents, and whatever, but have no children, no descendants. You know, and usually it's the executor of the will that, that approaches me. Another possibility is um, friends of the archives. Now, there are people who want to help the archives, but they don't want to do hands-on material. So you can form a friends of the archives kind of association. Point over there, friends of the archives. And these people can act as sort of a reserve, a pool of occasional volunteers when required. They can network with the larger community, including the non-Ukrainian community, and assist with joint projects uh, with other community members, the Ukrainian schools, senior citizens, and also, more, most importantly, with uh, fundraising. Uh, for example, uh, Osredok, as far as I know, is affiliated with the Canadian Museums Association, Canadian Heritage Information Network, Virtual Museum of Canada, and all these are sources of information on grants and fundraising. Sometimes they offer grants for shelving, for preservation of various kinds, and it's very important to tap into these sources. <laughs> Specific potential donors, and these are individuals and organizations, may be contacted, preferably in person, to make a regular donation to the archives. Uh, they can also form uh, partnerships with uh, Ukrainian genealogical groups, family history groups. And there are some in most major centers in Toronto, Ottawa. And uh, with over 100 years of Ukrainian experience in Canada, there are people now of Ukrainian origin who don't know where their ancestors came from in Ukraine. They don't even know what their original name is. But they want to travel to Ukraine. They want to go visit the Rydna Sala or whatever. And they, they show up at these meetings. And uh, they usually bring a shoebox of their grandfather's, great-grandfather's Austro-Hungarian passport and whatever. <coughs> and they want to know more. In some cases, they even ask me, uh, when they have no documentation, for me to tell them, are they Ukrainian or Polish or Jewish? And this happened when I was working at the archives, and it even happens now. We have people, but again, because of intermarriage in Canada, uh, after all these generations, you have people with uh, English last names or even French names. I have met people from Quebec with French names, <coughs> and uh, their great grandfather was Ukrainian. Uh, some of them have even kept their Ukrainian name; they can't say a word of Ukrainian. And uh, I would ask them, "Where are your ancestors come from?" And they would say, "Chernobyl." So that's the only place they knew in Ukraine. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, these people need help. They can be invited to the archives. Uh, meetings can be held at the archives, for example. Uh, to give you another quick example, the City of Ottawa Archives now uh, allows their premises to be used by the local branch of the Ukrainian National Federation for various events. So this is where you get circulation. You have people coming and going and using, and you fi familiarize them with what's going on. The other thing is uh, university professors. Uh, Professor Stolarik, who teaches Slovak studies at the University of Ottawa, insists that his graduate students use archival sources. And their mark on their papers, whatever, depends on how much archival sources they've used. And I would like to you know, encourage U uh, Ukrainian academics in Canada to do the same thing. This way, uh, the students will visit the archives. Maybe they won't find anything there, whatever, but they'll at least familiarize themselves with the language, the terminology. You know, what is a phone? What is a file? Uh, this and that. You know, how, organized, uh, how archives are organized. <coughs> and also, uh, people who visit the archives uh, may even consider archives as a career or profession. So this is something to, uh, to, to take into consideration. Uh, networking. Uh, 
There has been an informal system of networking of Ukrainian archives thanks to the Canadian Association of Slavists. We had annual meetings, and every year I would uh, go, there would be a panel organized, and uh, we would discuss archival issues and find out who's doing what and where. Um, I made an effort to keep in contact with other Ukrainian archives across Canada at that time. Uh, I had access to a phone. Uh, this was in the pre-email uh, years. Uh, I had access to mail, like postage, whatever, so I could mail stuff back and forth. It was not a problem. And there was material that I didn't want. I would send it to either Osredok or to other archives that collected this kind of material. I would deal. I would keep in contact with uh, no, most notably Zenon Hlushok at Osredok, George Brandak at the University of British Columbia Archives. I also consulted with uh, Andriy Makuk and Yaris Balan here in, uh, at Kios. It's now easier to maintain contact through social media on questions dealing with acquisitions and trends in research, especially if uh, information about visiting graduate students to find out who's doing what and where and what the trends are in Ukrainian uh, research. Uh, this uh, tradition can continue through an archivist working in the Ukrainian archives with access to communications. It would also be to the archivist's personal and professional benefit to know what's going on in the field of Ukrainian-Canadian archives. And this information can be shared with other archivists across Canada. Um, this is important because sometimes decisions have to be made on the spot. And going through a committee and panels and this and that, I don't think it works. To give you a very quick example, uh, I had a phone call from Toronto once. This is uh, when the Association of United <coughs> Ukrainian Canadians were moving their bookstore from Bloor Street to another location. And some Ukrainian was walking by the front of the bookstore and he noticed that, you know, most of it was empty, except on the, on the main floor, there was a big mound of books. So he phones me and he says, Bada Mavrik, they're destroying books, they're throwing Ukrainian books into the, into the dumpster. So I phoned uh, Andrei Hrvorovich, who was at the University of Toronto at that time, to go down on Bloor Street to, to check this bookstore and see what's going on. After a couple of hours, he phones me back and he starts laughing. And I asked him, well, what's, what's, what are these books? And he says, these are the Ukrainian translations of the works of Mao Zedong. <laughs> <laughs> you know, who wants this material? Well, again, okay, if it's lost, it's, I don't think it's going to impact Ukrainian-Canadian culture and history. But it's, you know, the decision had to be made on the spot. When you would deal with other material, for example, when there was a boom, there was a boom in, as there is now, in Toronto real estate. People were selling houses, and the children would be living in California. They would fly in very quickly and clean the house out and put it up for sale. <coughs> and the parents were usually community leaders of one kind or another. And you would have Vishivanya, you would have Orizba, uh, uh, you would have all kinds of uh, Ukrainian artworks, you know. And uh, they would uh, phone me up and say, Panamamrika, <coughs> all my parents' stuff is on the lawn. If you want to come and if you want to come and get it, it's it's available, and this includes books and whatever you know, sort of stuff. So again, I try to phone somebody in Toronto to go and have a look at this material. And this kind of inf uh, this kind of problem is, is a constant one. And my suggestion in this case and in other cases is that people who have this kind of material should plan for their preservation and disposal now, and they should put uh, uh, some kind of instructions in their will. Or, in some cases, they should actually make gifts of this material to their children and grandchildren, so they know who would appreciate to have this material and who, who wouldn't. And they also put in their will, uh, I want this stuff to go there and there, and leave money, so that this material can be transported to these institutions. And in, I include that, uh, I include uh, uh, archival material. Demographic changes. <coughs> I'll get to that in a minute. <clears throat> Demographic changes. Although there are over one million Canadians of Ukrainian descent, the integration and assimilation process is a real factor when predicting the future of the Ukrainian community. There has been a serious decline in attendance in the core Ukrainian churches compared to the 1950s. But this is a general Canadian democrat, uh, demographic trend. There's language loss among second and third generations. It's very serious. It's down to like 1%. And this, this is especially true 
uh, where there are no Ukrainian institutions. And I should mention that Ukrainians now live in every part of Canada. There's a Ukrainian community in Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, uh, Quebec City, mostly uh, Ukrainian immigrants from uh, Ukraine. So, <clears throat> but on the plus side, uh, Ukrainians can now send their children to Ukraine for total immersion. And this is what some ethnic groups do. Uh, the Lebanese community, for example, send their children to spend the summer with the grandparents in Lebanon. People from Sweden who want their kids to learn Swedish, they send them to Sweden for, uh, for a while. Uh, in India, same story. In India, not only do they send their children there, but they pick prospective brides for their sons here in <laughs> Canada. So you get into these kinds of changes, and this has to be taken into consideration. Now, dealing with finances, much of what has been mentioned so far cannot be accomplished without finances, which in almost all cases is key to maintaining many of the factors which contribute to the sustainability of community archives. Funding is a core function of any community archives, and archival institutions must have regular dependable funding. Money purchases skilled staff, storage, preservation, and other essential requirements for archival maintenance. <clears throat> when I worked in the multiculturalism program, Secretary of State, Ukrainians were known for their skills at grantsmanship. Uh, the grant applications were professionally done. Uh, they came from all parts of the community, and in many cases they were rewarded with grants, and this includes dance groups, uh, whatever. And uh, so my suggestion is to continue this tradition. There are grants available from various federal government uh, programs, uh, for summer works, for example, for students uh, who want to work uh, to get the higher students to work in the archives, and Kios itself. Uh, in the 1990s, uh, Kios was provided funds to hire summer students, and they worked on quite a large number of collections. And the finding aids are now part of the publications of Kios. They're available on the internet, and uh, people in Ukraine look at them. And they contact me, and you know, can you send me photocopies? Of <laughs> one box or two boxes and whatever, I say, I'm sorry, I, I'm retired. Okay. <clears throat> uh, also, there's various Ukrainian foundations, and one is the Taras Shevchenko Foundation. And one suggestion that was made was that the Shevchenko Foundation should set aside a certain amount of money strictly for archival work. And, uh, but again, uh, this is uh, this, you're getting into policy about the Shevchenko Foundation. Complaints were that too much money was spent on dancing groups. But that is the face of our community, it's the Ukrainian dancing groups. And that's one way of bringing in the youth is getting them involved in the dancing groups. Archives, as I said, is a problem and remains a problem. Okay. Now, this is an example of fundraising. Uh, they had a very nice poster, which I couldn't copy. But this is, uh, shows you that they're having a fundraising event. And it's a beer, barabola, and bratwurst festival with prizes, 50-50 draw. And uh, it's on May 24th, so those of you who are from Winnipeg, it's still time to. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, I know that uh, the Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian Canadian Research and Documentation Center does fundraisings. Other, uh, but this is how you have. This is what you have to do to survive. And unfortunately, uh, sometimes you spend more time doing this than doing archival work. But that's that's the way things are. Now, I wanted to mention this. Those of you who are from Winnipeg know what this institution is. <clears throat> it's the Ukrainian Labor Farmer Temple Association, the temp Labor Temple in Winnipeg. And they invited me last August to visit them. And I spent four days going through their holdings and giving them some kind of a, giving them an analysis and a report on, um, on their holdings. And the reason I'm bringing this to your attention is that <clears throat> Labor Temple has reached the stage now, and they are about 20, 30 years ahead of what will probably happen to Ukrainian community archives and I might say institutions in the rest of Canada. Uh, they have some fairly serious problems. For example, this is an old building. It was built 100 years ago. Uh, 
There's no parking because at that time people didn't own cars. It's the same story with some of our old Ukrainian churches. They are built downtown in the ethnic areas, <coughs> which are now occupied by Chinese or, or Portuguese or Filipinos. <coughs> people don't want to go there because it's, they don't, they're not familiar with the area. They don't want to go there at nighttime <coughs> because it's a high crime area. So this has, these all have to be uh, taken into consideration. Now, the uh, AUC, Association of United Ukrainian Canadians, especially the Toronto people, have donated archives to Ottawa. And they were organized uh, and they were, have been used by researchers. And they are grateful for that because uh, this whole exercise was successful. Uh, there are uh, access restrictions, there's a, a professional management, storage, and uh, uh, the material is there. Also the fact that uh, the RCMP security service records are also at the uh, archives in Ottawa, and there's tons of material on the Labour Temple. Uh, where I come from in Val d'Or, Quebec, it's a small community, at one time they had 500 people living there. The left was very strong there. <coughs> the RCMP compiled a file of 1,000 of uh, 1,100 pages on that community alone, <coughs> and this goes through all across Canada. Uh, large, a lot of a lot of the communities. If you are interested in the local history of a, of your community, my advice is to check with uh, National Archives in Ottawa and see what they have as far as the RCMP records go on your local community, and you will find their material that you cannot find anywhere else. And uh, it's, it's unbelievable how thorough the informant's work was. In every year of these communities, they had informants, and uh, they provided information on all kinds of questions. A lot of the information, of course, is based on newspaper clippings that they've cut out. Um, I should mention that the fellow who's doing that in Ottawa for many years was a Ukrainian fellow from Oshawa. Anyways, uh, I did write a report and uh, this is the, my report that I've submitted. And uh, <coughs> this gives you an example of some of the holdings. <coughs> These are the newspapers that they have there going back to when the temple was founded. Now the reason I'm bringing it to your attention is that I found out when I was in, in, in Winnipeg at that time that the provincial government back in 1919 passed a law that anything published in Manitoba and after 1919, a copy should be deposited with the legislative library. So all their newspapers here, uh, my suggestion that they should, be, they should be transferred to the legislative library. And the argument is, oh yeah, well we have the microfilm already. So yeah, but you need the originals because even the microfilm is a problem. And that's one reason I'm wearing thick glasses. I spent too much time looking at microfilm readers. Uh, and uh, these are fantastic sources of information on the Ukrainians in Canada and on the Ukrainian labor movement in Canada. Here are their archives. And uh, as you can notice on the upper left, there's some photo they have a, a room just for photographs. Uh, the boxes are all marked. They're in archival uh, quality boxes. But again, uh, they don't have anybody there who can really manage the archives. You have the odd researcher that shows up there. Uh, Rhonda Hinter, for example, has just published a book on the Ukrainian left-wing movement in Canada, and she used the archives there. And uh, again, some of this material probably would be better located, better used at, let's say, the university archives or the provincial archives. So it's some kind of, uh, some lobbying has to take place there. <coughs> Now this is a real problem because here, this is one of their storage rooms. You can notice that they have all their folklore stuff for their dancing group. They don't have a dancing group anymore as far as I know. I think there is, there was some attempts made to revive the dancing group. And uh, these are the films in one of their storage rooms. <coughs> and uh, I counted about over 80 containers. Now these are films from Soviet Ukraine. And there's only one, I think, I found that dealt with a Canadian subject, and this was 1965 when the Canadian parliamentary de delegation visited Soviet Ukraine. They filmed it. Now the question is finding a home for this material. Because there's no Canadian content, no Canadian institution wants to acquire this material. 
And I did, con there was a film expert from Ukraine visiting Ottawa last week, and I spoke to him. And uh, he said, I asked him, I said, if these are produced in Soviet Ukraine, are there still copies in Soviet Ukraine? And he said, I doubt it. He doesn't know what happens to this material. Because, because of the chaos that happened in Ukraine after 91, uh, some of that material may have disappeared. And, uh, or just trying to locate it. Or it might be in a warehouse somewhere, totally unmarked. We don't know what happened to it. So this is something that has to be taken into consideration. I did get a collection of Soviet films from Montreal. And I tried finding a place for that. And eventually at the Harvard Ukrainian Institute in Boston, uh, Cambridge, uh, took it. And uh, they took it just at the time 9-11 happened. <laughs> so it sat on the border for a whole year before it was transferred over there. Uh, my suggestion to them, as, as I mentioned earlier, is that this material should be organized and eventually deposited, transferred to an archives with a legislative mandate. And we're talking about, you know, down the road. Uh, federal, provincial archives are pro probably the best places, but even they have problems. You know, when they have uh, fluctuations in the federal provincial budgets, uh, that affects sometimes the number of archivists working, contract work, equipment, whatever. Uh, second point is um, university archives and city archives. Uh, that's another possibility. Actually, university archives are probably the best place for archives because the students are on spot. The academics are there and they would go and use this mat material. A financial donation to a university archives may facilitate the acceptance of the archives of an organization or individual if the subject material also meets the acquisition criteria of the university archives. Making arrangements with other organizations, associations, and community archives is a problem because uh, there is a danger that the archives and libraries are usually the first casualties when an organization finds itself in financial difficulty. And this may threaten the pres preservation of the archival material. Getting towards the conclusion, uh, this is, by the way, uh, the Avant uh, Franco room at the uh, Labor Temple. And uh, you may notice that the books are double stacked, they ran out of space. So behind this first layer, there's a second layer. And a lot of these books are from Soviet Ukraine. And the big problem is Shorobete, you know. Uh, is there an institution in Canada that would accept this material? And uh, until a solution is found, it's in storage. And it's, it's uh, people have devoted, a lot of volunteers devoted a lot of time and effort to this material. Uh, the, big general, the other big problem in Canada, of course, is Ukrainian literature courses are gradually declining. And professors who have been teaching in the area of Ukrainian literature, when they retire, that's it. They're not being replaced. Okay. So this is what I was mentioning earlier. Contacts with archival institutions, federal and provincial archives, university archives, and organizations, associations, and community archives. And this is sort of in the order of priority. Now, dealing with uh, the future. Osiradok was established in, by the Ukrainian National Federation in 1944 in Winnipeg as a museum, archives, library, and art gallery. Uh, from 1939, the German rule in Ukraine was a threat. And after that, after 44, a threat from, a perceived threat from the Soviet Union. So the year of the founding of Osiradok, 1944, says something. The course of the war in Eastern Europe forecast that all of Ukraine could become part of the Soviet Union. This meant that the traditional cultural language, historical traditions of Ukraine were threatened. And Osiradok was created partly to preserve Ukrainian language and culture in Canada. I should mention that the Polish Institute of Arts and Culture in Canada was founded in 1943, and the Canadian Polish Congress was founded in September 1944 for exactly the same reason. Uh, if you remember that uh, Warsaw Uprising failed in August 1944. 
So uh, this became a, a serious problem uh, for the uh, not only Ukrainian but Polish communities. Uh, what do you do? So the big question is, <coughs> did the UNF expect in 1944 that the Ukrainian community would still be viable in 2018? Will the community still be viable in 2118? So when you're dealing with archival questions, preservation, you have to sort of think long term. Uh, when I worked at the archives, the, the saying was that 10 years is a very short time for archives. Now, archives in Ukraine. When I worked at the Library and Archives in Ottawa, I regularly, regularly received letters from the National Archives of Ukraine saying, Panamomarek, send us everything you have. <coughs> and we did send some material. Uh, the Ukrainian National Government in Exile Fund was transferred to Ukraine in 1995-96 because when this material was donated in 1980, the deed of gift included a statement that this material will be transferred to Ukraine after Ukraine became independent. So in 1980, they knew what was going to happen 10 years later. <laughs> Since the independence of Ukraine, a number of researchers, scholars have discovered the Ukrainian diaspora in Canada and have embarked on major research projects. For example, the Dovidnek that I showed earlier that uh, Irina Matyas put together. And this was a product of her research and work and everybody benefits. Recently, various organizations, for example, the Holodomor Museum from Kiev, have contacted, have contacted uh, the Ukrainian community in Canada, asking for donations, uh, financial, and including uh, archival material. So, uh, and they are not the only ones. Uh, there was also, uh, uh, some people have donated their material to Ukraine, but they did it privately. In Ottawa, one lady donated her photograph collection that her father put together. He was working for the uh, co-op movement in Ukraine in the 30s and the 1940s during the war. And he went across the countryside f uh, photographing Ukrainian customs and religious observances and whatever. <coughs> she had a copy made of this. And uh, it was... Uh, 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 she found somebody at the Ukrainian embassy who was traveling back to Ukraine and she gave them these photographs and she says take them to archives in Ukraine. After a couple of months no news. So she found the, well, she asked well what happened? The lady lost the material. Oh, wow. So you know even people at the embassy who are supposed to <laughs> help out as best as you can it, it was a problem. But anyways <coughs> I want to conclude by saying that uh, I just heard recently that uh, the Ukrainian government is going to be sta establishing uh, a Ukrainian institute, much in the same tradition as the Goethe Institute by the German government and the Institut Francais uh, by the French government. The big question is there, what impact will this institute have on the preservation and development of Ukrainian culture in Canada? And this remains to be seen. And this, uh, the big question is there, will it include archives? And this is the uh, Museum of the Diaspora in Kiev. And they're also sending out inquiries, asking people to donate material. Uh, I will be going to Kiev in August. Hopefully I will be able to visit this place and find out uh, what, you know, Who's, who's looking after this organization? Is, the, is it government supported or not? And here, this is from their webpage, and it says quite clearly, you know, Zokrema Muzei Zbaraya Teki Exponante, Historichni Material is DP Tabori, Knehe, Plakteke, Viddani is DP Tabori, DP Tabori, Takosh Osubesti Prachi, Foros, Liste, you know, uh, and on and on and on. Uh, so you can see basically they are asking for material from here to go to Ukraine. So the big question is, uh, you know, is this a legitimate operation? And uh, has anybody sent material to them? 
and we'd like to know. And uh, so on that point, on that question mark, I'd like to end my presentation. Thank you. If anybody can find a solution to preserving digital records over the long term permanently, they can make a lot of money. But uh, as I said, talk to them. You don't have to preserve everything. So this is the other thing. If you have an archivist uh, and you know, with a historical background, even with organizations, for example, not know what to what is for, they can tell you what to preserve. Okay? Some things you do not have to preserve. And like I said earlier, this has been a real problem for me is to tell people to Tony Evergen. I said, sure, what? You know? I had people from uh, uh, Montreal who were involved in helping DPs coming to Canada. And they wanted everything, you know, every scrap of little paper, every postcard, whatever, you know. And I said, you know, you, you're not the Lenin, you know, you <laughs> can't keep everything, you know, you're not the Rashevchenko. Sure, sure, sure. You know. Yeah, <laughs> So anyways, uh, this is where you have to do some selecting. And uh, sometimes we deal with organizations, okay, you know, the Donal Kobe material has to be preserved you know, in some form. But uh, generally speaking, uh, the annual reports will do. They tell the whole story. Uh, you know, they tell you what kind of financial records to keep. You don't keep everything. You keep material by law, you have to keep material for seven years for income tax purposes. But you know, buying and selling of office furniture and that kind of stuff. You know, uh, hiring people to do casual work that have not, that's not connected to the organization. Uh, that's not important. You know. uh, but this has to be done, you know, conscientiously, uh, some of the archival historical background, so that you don't, you know, get rid of material that is valuable. And. Uh, <coughs> My suggestion is that for organizations, like no COVID to what is to others, is to organize the material as professionally as possible with finding aids. So that when you approach it, an archive, for example, that has a legislative mandate, city archives, a provincial archives, you can say, we have this material, we'd like to donate it, and you don't have to do any work. It's all organized for you, okay? You just find storage space for it. And in most cases, they'll take it. Because again, finding and paying an archivist to do this kind of work, it uh, you know, can, tends to be sometimes a bit expensive <coughs> and tedious. But uh, if the material is already organized and it's reduced to the core information, the most important information within that organization, I don't know you mean yet. But in your own private stuff, well, that's entirely up to you, you know, uh, what you want to do with your own private material. And my suggestion that, you know, you, you should. You should look, check with an archivist not here, elsewhere. Uh, we have the Human Rights Museum in, uh, in Winnipeg, collects material dealing with Eastern Europe. We have the Holocaust Museum in, uh, in Washington. I was surprised to find out that they also collect material 
on Ukrainians who were in the DP camps, birth certificates, and things like that. So it's a, it's a place to consider, it's a place to, to, to check. And later today we'll have a presentation by digital archivists from the University of Hubbard Archives, so you came to follow up on this question. Um, uh, yeah, no, um, regarding the uh, films that the labor sample, um, there is an archive in Ukraine, it's called Shaneshte Archive, that uh, specializes in, um, I guess, um, this type of uh, media films and photographs. Have, have you been in touch with them? And, uh, no, the, my goal is to make sure that this material stays here. Okay. Sending this kind of material to Ukraine is a problem. You can contact them to find out if they already have this film. You know, if they already have it, then okay, you can read a little bit easier. But uh, my goal is to have this material stay in Canada, or at least in North America, you know, with the Ukraine, with the uh, Harvard Institute, or uh, so that people can have access to it. Otherwise, you'd have to travel to Ukraine if you're interested in this material. Or send someone from, from there here to take care of it. Yeah, that's, that's the other thing. But before that happens, I want to make sure that every possibility here is exhausted. But it has to be preserved some way, despite the political messages and whatever, that you know, the Cold War and everything else that we went through, uh, and, and the propaganda value of it. But I can see that 50 years down the road, 100 years down the road, they, they will, people will be interested in this experiment that took place in the Soviet Union. 1918, 1991. Uh, Jason? Good morning. So I'm Jason I'm representing the Chenomwashi Ukrainian Dance Company, and we recently <coughs> started an archive, actually, of our materials. Um, we're coming up on 50 years as an organization, and we've contracted an archivist to come in and, and go through the collection and clean it out. Um, and I think it will live with us for some amount of time. My question is, in terms of if it ever becomes necessary in the future to transfer it to a legislated institution, um, how do they generally like to, I mean, aside from saying here's a block of stuff, I mean, we're an active organization, I'm presuming it will stay that way. Can I donate part of an archive, and then we can have some collection arrangement into the future in this type of thing, where it's not once the organization has reached some point of demise where we would, we would do that, but do it in, in a progressive, exactly. ongoing fashion. How does that? No, no, that? no you, 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 you've, you've answered your own question. Uh, but, uh, you could do this, uh, have a partnership, an ongoing partnership with a museum, for example, or the folklore center here, for example, uh, other institutions across Canada uh, that collect this material and preserve it. And, and as material, uh, for example, uh, there is costumes and this and that become outdated or used or whatever. But you can do it, throw them out, whatever. But you can select some of the most it's important. Not, it's not even the costume collection. It's more the, the not the textual, textual material, now digital material. I mean, there's 7,000 photographs. There's um, 20 years of musical scores. There's a collection of film and video from as early as 1971. Um, that's part of that collection. So all of those kind of multimedia materials are there. The costumes is a whole other, yeah, exactly. which is unmanageable because it's too large. So. Well, as I said <coughs> that, uh, in my opening statement, <coughs> that uh, there are people in Canada, institutions, including at the legislative ones, who don't believe in multicultural. And you approach them and they will say, well, that's not, that's not needed. Or that's not stuff that we're interested in. So you have to do lobbying work there. You have to go and find institutions that would welcome this kind of material. And this is an ongoing process. You have to cultivate uh, contacts, whatever, uh, so that, uh, and you can tell, and so that they will know the value of this material. And this is what I was saying earlier about professors, that uh, professors, uh, okay, in folklore studies or cultural studies of various kinds, they should encourage their students to go and visit these archives and use this material. And they don't have to be Ukrainian. Mm -hmm. this, is, uh, this is what I find, that the material since about 1960, even at Kuk, at Kuk level, most of it's in English now. So you don't have to become a Ukrainian language uh, specialist to, to have access to this material. 
And, uh, but whoever the person is looking after this material has to know a little bit about the cultural history of Ukrainians in Canada. You know, why do these groups perform and flourish? Because they are the visible face of the Ukrainian community in Canada. And people can join them and belong to them. They don't have to be Ukrainian. You know, uh, this is uh, like in Ottawa. We have a Ukrainian dance group there. And I think about half the people there are not Ukrainian. They might have a Ukrainian ancestor somewhere up the family tree. But, and that's their experience of being Ukrainian. And that's what draws them into the community. Some of them then become instructors in the dance group. You know, go on from there. So it's a uh, talk to, uh, as I said, to, to John Paul. Uh, talk to an archivist. It's like you said, you hired someone to look into it, especially in the cultural area, and uh, take it from there. Uh, unfortunately, we ran out of time. I hope we'll continue uh, with questions and discussions throughout the three days. But thank you again, and I'm